monads, then C of T is exactly the sigma algebras and homomorphisms that, uh, that you know before. <coughs> and this extends to the case where there are, uh, there are equations on there. So you take this thing to be uh, terms modulo the equations. <coughs> um, so the way, the way I like to think about this is, is that uh, the, um, the Tleisley category uh, is, uh, is well, we'll explain that. So that's going to contain free algebras. And these, these guys, these general algebras, these are things that already have the structure that T adds. Okay, so um, so if you take T to be uh, to be the um, the free monoid function on sets, for example, then algebras for that are just monoids. Um, but, uh, I'll explain. So the relationship between all those three categories, and I will stop uh, once I've explained this. Uh, the relationship between these three categories, we've now got the base category that we started with C. We've got this Claisley category CP, uh, which has the same objects but these Claisley maps. And then we've got the eilenberg moore category, C sup T, uh, which has these um, uh, T algebras and T algebra homomorphisms as, um, <coughs> as objects. And it turns out there's a bunch of functors between there. So there's a functor F, which is a free functor, goes from C into the Claisley category, uh, C of T. And this is just the identity on objects and on maps in C from A to B. It has to turn it into something from... Um, uh, a to TB up here, which it does just by post-composing the beta. <coughs> um, then these guys can be seen as algebras. There's a, so the objects in here are, uh, are the objects of the original category, um, but uh, we can turn that e each one of those into one of these algebras, the free algebra, which is we need to get something which goes from T of X into X, and we can always get that if we take X to be T of something else. Okay, because that's just what mu did. It went from t squared into t. <coughs> okay, so the um, uh, if you if you have an object in here, then uh, phi takes you into the algebra mu, which goes from t squared of a into t of a. You can always construct that guy, and that's called the free t algebra um, on a. <coughs> and then it turns out there's a couple of adjunctions here, um, so uh, you can go. You have f followed by um, phi up here is left adjoint to this forgetful functor here, which takes an algebra and just throws away all the algebra structure and just returns the object. So u of, uh, of, of alpha from ta to a is just a. Then this functor here um, is um, left adjoint to this one. And um <coughs> this one is left adjoint to this one. So we have two adjunctions here, one between c and ct and one between uh, C, C sup t and one between C and uh, C sub t and both of these adjunctions actually give you back the original monad. So remember t was a functor from C to C and if you go around, if you go around here then um, the composite uh, f phi mu is the original t that you started with. So, um, so whenever you've got a monad you can split it up into an adjunction and that adjunction gives you back the monad. You can split it up into a junction, into an adjunction in at least two ways. So this is uh, this is one way, and this is uh, this is another way. And I shall stop there. That's right. Uh, well, I mean, there are, I, I, I will talk about Haskell monads uh, uh, later on, um, but um, but you're right. This the, the story I've told so far is about giving semantics to generally effectful languages, and then the whole the whole Haskell story came from looking at what people did in semantics, and then say, and then bringing it back the other way and saying let's turn that into a programming pattern. 
Um, so, but Haskell does actually, of course, know about Mono because there's two kinds of uses of Mono in Haskell. One is where you define a type constructor that satisfies these things within your program, in which case Haskell just treats it as another piece of code. But then there are some monads, like the IO monad and the ST monad, which are built in. And there the Haskell compiler does know about those things because it knows it compiles those in a different way. So this is sort of based on, on some, some lectures that I and Eugenio and, and John Hughes gave. So there's a, there's a, there's a paper in the APSEM called Monads and Effects that's by me and Eugenio and John Hughes that's kind of uh, everything I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so, yes. <coughs> uh, they're not yet, but they will be when I finish them. <laughs> anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.